Hello and welcome to the I Want to Know podcast. I'm Josh Spector and I am your host. If you don't know who I am, I'm the creator of the For the Interested newsletter, which you can check out at fortheinterested.com. If you're new here, this podcast exists to help creative entrepreneurs get their questions answered. Here's how it works. In each episode, a different guest comes on and asks me three questions. Then we have a 10-minute conversation about each of them. I hopefully share some helpful tips to help them and you grow your audience in business. And that's about it. No fluff, lots of actionable stuff. My guest today, you should listen to his show if for no other reason than he has an introduction that is way more impressive than mine. He has the best podcast introduction in the business. But that aside, today's guest is Joe Ferraro. After recording over 300 conversations and studying thousands more, Joe has figured out what makes a damn good conversation. Every week since 2017, he's released a new episode of his podcast, 1% Better, featuring in-depth interviews with some amazing guests, including James Clear, Seth Godin, Mitch Album, Annie Duke, and even me. I don't remember what episode number I was on there, but we'll link to it in the show notes. When he's not recording, Joe coaches entrepreneurs and authors to communicate their very best through his consulting company, Damn Good Conversations. And when he's away from the mic, he's impacting young people in his 24th year as a high school teacher. And if you are watching this on video, you will see he is in his classroom as we speak. You can connect with Joe on Twitter at Ferraro on air. With that in mind, Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks for doing this. Beautiful introduction in all the ways. And that sounds so good with the music underneath it. So it is <laughs> yeah. worth it for people to, to go back and hear Ken Scott introduce me on my podcast. A long story for another day but hired Ken, and that's why it's the best intro in the business. So thank you. I'm so jealous. It's so good. Great music, great intro. Yeah, I'd rip it off if I could. So I'm really excited for our conversation today. We are going to talk about some podcast stuff. Joe's been doing this a long time, has expertise in it. I have been doing it not quite as long a time, but feel like I'm off to a pretty good start and have learned a bunch. And we're going to talk about that. The other thing is, I think if nothing else, even if you don't have a podcast, you really need to listen to this first question we're going to talk about because it's something I haven't talked about on this show before. And I think I have a ton of listeners and people in my audience that it is relevant to. And that is we're going to talk about, I'll let Joe get into it in a second, but we're going to talk about doing this whole creator entrepreneur thing as sort of a side hustle or secondary thing as opposed to trying to make it your full-time job. And again, when Joe was mentioned he wanted to talk about that, I was like, oh my God, this is something that so many people are interested in and we haven't touched on. So I'm really excited about it. And so with that, without me spoiling it too much, let's let's get right into it. Joe, what is the first thing that you want to know? The first thing I want to know is about time, Josh. How okay. do we get return on our time investment? And I, I wrote this out to be efficient. You work with creative entrepreneurs. It can mean mm -hmm. a million things. And it's on the top of your Twitter bio. And we see it and we know it and you live it. But there's a through line, no matter if you're full-time, part-time, side hustle, whatever. And that's un just, just time is not unlimited. For someone like me and knowing my, my specific situation, I think it could be a stand-in for a lot of people. Full-time teacher in the classroom now so that I could have some boundaries when I go home. But you know those boundaries don't always exist because I'm also working with clients. I've been lucky enough to coach podcast hosts, podcast guests, and my current client that I'm working with most extensively right now is a TEDx speaker preparing to give a talk in India. And that's a beautiful story of how that came to be. So I want to be transparent. I've been lucky. I've been fortunate. I've worked hard. I have clients that are paying me for my services. They recognize some degree of experience or expertise, and it's flattering as all heck. But I'm ambitious. I, I, mm -hmm. I like to think I'm creative. I want to grow. I also want to see my family. I know we can't have it all. Like I also, we always heard, you can, you can have anything you want, but you just can't have everything. Yeah. What I want to know is, what are the next two or three things that I, and by proxy listeners, can do to kind of take those seismic leaps? I talk about 1% better on my show, mm -hmm. but how do people who are not doing it full time What's the next move that really moves that boulder? So again, a great question. I'm going to start with some sort of generalities and get into some more specifics about your situation. But the first thing I want to say is this. I love that you frame this in the context of a time question. And I would start by saying, even if you're doing this full time, even if you have nothing else to focus on, but your sort of creative entrepreneurial efforts, your time is going to be limited. 
there's never going to be enough time to do all the things that you want to do. If you're doing it as a side hustle or sort of a secondary thing, you have even less time, which means anyone who's doing this needs to learn how to become efficient and learns to need, know how to prioritize and focus on the things that are really going to move the needle. That's even more true if this is sort of a side project and your time is even more limited. So I think that's the first important thing because I think a lot of people would ask this question without the sort of time component. So they would sort of go, how do I get more out of my side hustle or how do I get more out of my thing? And you're really focusing it on like, look, I know I need to address the time crunch and I need to be more efficient and understand where the impact comes. So with that as context, here's a couple things that I think it would be important for you and everyone else to, to think about. And here's how I would first approach it. One, you need to get really clear on what you actually want from a goal perspective. Because especially when this isn't your sort of full-time main gig, if it's your full-time main gig, a lot of times they're like, well, I need this to make us, I need to make a certain amount of money. I need this to sustain me. I need this to be fulfilling all of those things. You want a lot of those things too, but you know, you're not depending on this to survive. So you need to think about like, what are your actual goals? And when I say this, I don't just mean your podcast, but I mean all the, all the time and effort you're putting into this bucket of sort of side stuff. Are you doing it to make money? Are you doing it to make an impact? How much time do you want to spend on this? Is this a side hustle that you want to spend five hours a week or 20 hours a week? Is this something that you only want to work on at nights or only want to work on on the weekends? Getting really clear for like what you want this to look like. Then thinking about of the work and of the stuff that you're doing, what do you most enjoy what do you want to do more of? The flip side of that as well, right? It's just as important to put up some boundaries and think about what do you not want or what doesn't matter to you? You might say, this is really an impact thing for me that I like doing and I don't really care about money. This assumption that every sort of creation or creative effort needs to be monetized is not true and is especially not true if you're doing it as a side hustle. Nothing wrong with monetizing it, but understanding for yourself, you might go, you know what? I just like helping people. Or this is like a hobby and I like doing it and it doesn't have to become a business or maybe it does or maybe you want it to, right? So really thinking through as opposed to looking at what you're doing and sort of going like, okay, well, what do I do next? Where it's really easy to fall into those traps of I have to grow the podcast. I have to monetize the podcast. I have to do X, Y, and Z. You're kind of creating, I don't want to say the box, but you're creating the package of this is what I would like my quote unquote side hustle time to look like and what I'd like to get out of it. The other thing I would say here is once you think about that, the reason why that's really important is I nor anyone else nor yourself can tell you what to do until you know what you want. So strategy needs to be aligned and come out of a desired destination. And until you pick a destination, it's the equivalent of looking at a map without a destination chosen. You see all the roads, you see all the potential destinations, but you don't know whether to turn right or left because you don't actually know where you want to go. And I see a lot of people who they're not really clear on where they want to go, what they want, and that's why they get sort of paralyzed. Now, it doesn't mean that your destination might change. You might start down a path and say, oh, I want to monetize this podcast. And somewhere along the line, you go, you know what? I don't really want to do that. I just want to make an impact and help these kinds of people. So you can always change and reroute yourself to extend the sort of GPS analogy. But a GPS is useless if you don't type in a location that you wanted to take it to. So that would be the first thing I, is I would think about what you want, where you want to go, and then the strategy will come out of that. So before I get into more specifics, and I know we've talked about this a little bit before, but tell me a little bit about, with that in mind, where you think you might want to go, what you might want to get out of this, what you like doing the most, that kind of stuff. That background is really helpful. And I think you play with the GPS analogy. You think you play with the North Star analogy. Mm -hmm. I am at a place where I would like to get paid and get paid more for my creative projects. Right now, I have an example of what you're talking about. There's a high-ranking baseball executive who, for whatever reason, reached out to me and wanted to just jam on communication stuff. So we have regular calls and I'm not expecting to charge him and he's not expecting me to be his coach formally, but that's a project that I would take on for free, right? And we all take mm -hmm. free projects that have something else in it. But 
when I coach someone who's preparing a TED talk, which is going to have tremendous monetary results for the person if it goes well, that's mm -hmm. something that time and effort I want to be paid for. So if I took a bucket and said, I, I'd love to get paid and get paid more and work with more interesting people and more diverse people, mm -hmm. with that vision in mind, I think it becomes interesting. Like I get a little tripped up with the Seth Godin mindset of like, he picks his projects here and there. So we'll have like a keynote, then mm -hmm. he may do a cohort. He may do it. And I love that. I'm attracted to that. But mm -hmm. I find that when you're attracted to different projects, at least for me, it becomes difficult to send up the bat signal for people to know what they're hiring you for. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things with that is looking for a through line or connective tissue between those different things. So coaching someone, and I know we talked before, and I think you said that you really liked, you had done some work coaching people who were going to be guests on podcasts. You had worked with hosts as well, and you liked both of those sides. But the idea that someone had a book to promote, a something to promote, they knew they were going to go on a bunch of podcasts. They came to you and essentially said, hey, help me prepare. How do I be a good guest? How do I make the most of these? And you had said that was one of the types of work that you enjoyed the most. Am I correct yes, in that? Definitely. This idea, okay. like I'm going on the podcast circuit and yeah. I need a coach to make me ready for that. To, because realistically, you, you're not going to sell books to someone if you can't give a good interview. It's almost a weird thing. Yeah. They have nothing to do with each other. Your ability to write, your ability to, to communicate on a show like this, they're not necessarily have to be aligned, but the public perception puts a huge value on that. Yeah. And I think so. I think that's a great I'm not saying you need to choose that as your your niche and your one or only thing. The other thing is niche is about ideal audience and ideal work, not only. So a lot of people hesitate to position themselves in a niche because they're like, but I can also do this. And I also like doing this other thing. And that's sort of what you're talking about, right? Like, I like helping the Ted person and I like this or that. You want to focus on the ideal. If you could do anything, what's the stuff you would choose to do the most? You will still get those other opportunities. I wind up working with people all the time that is not my ideal niche, but it's still a fit and I still like doing it. So it's not exclusive, but you want to position yourself in a way that you're attracting the stuff you would most like to do, the people you can best serve, et cetera. So for the purposes of this hypothetical, I think ultimately you should go and think through sort of what that is and what you want. But for the purposes of this hypothetical, I want to sort of talk through like next steps I would do if I were you, if we were focused on, I really want to help podcast guests prepare for their stuff and maybe podcast hosts as well, improve their shows. So here's how I would think about it and also sort of talk about it if I were you. Some of this is you're telling a story to potential clients and people in general about what you do and, and why you do it. So the first thing that popped up to me when we were talking before is this idea that you are sort of a new version of a media trainer. That in the old days, media trainers would help people essentially deal with interviews, deal with reporters, deal with the press, help them figure out their, their messaging. And I think if I were you, part of my story would be basically that the media world has changed and that the old version of media training was you were training people essentially on how to interact with middlemen and women, journalists, reporters, who were then going to take their story and tell their story in the media outlet. Podcasts are completely different because now there aren't those middlemen and you have the opportunity on a podcast as opposed to a journalist taking a couple snippets of what you said. Media trainers before were really telling you how to give a one or two good sound bites. Now you're telling people, here's how to take advantage of a half hour, 45 minute, an hour conversation where you, even though you're on the show, are able to speak directly to people. And that's what you are training people how to do. And that, to my knowledge, while I'm sure it exists a little bit, there's no one out there that I can think of that is like the specialist in that. And that's really valuable. And increasingly, more and more people are being guests on podcasts and multiple podcasts and both business people and authors and all sorts of people would love to have that skill. So if you go that direction, you sort of start to position yourself that way. The question becomes, how does everything that you do or choose to do, your podcast, your consulting, your messaging, if you use social media, whatever you do, how does every one of those things help accomplish that for an audience and help position you as that guy. 
And so I'm going to give you some specific examples of things you could do and ways you can tweak and amplify existing stuff that you're doing to suddenly reinforce that and provide that specific value as opposed to the, the sort of more generic, I help people learn how to have better conversations. So a few specific examples. One, what if the first 30 minutes of your 1% Better podcast was the typical podcast that you do now, which is great. I'm using 30 minutes. The, the number doesn't matter. But the first half or three quarters of the show is that. And then the last 15 or 20 minutes is your analysis of that conversation, explaining why it was good, explaining why it could have been better, pointing out both from a host and guest perspective, look at how this guest handled that question. Look at what they did. Look at me as a host, the opportunity I missed here or the way I got that person sort of to go where maybe they didn't want to go. So that now, number one, it makes your podcast different. You still get to do the sort of podcast that you're doing, but there's this added element so that people that want to hear a good conversation, but also want to learn how to have one. It's like a post-game show to use a sports analogy. You still get to do the show you're doing, but it reinforces your expertise. It also makes your show different than the typical show that is just an interview. And if people don't want that, some of your audience, maybe they just want to hear the interview with that person. That's fine. They log off after they hear the interview. So that's one way to take what you're doing and without a lot of additional time, effort, whatever, reinforce that messaging. Here's another example. If part of what you're going to be doing as a core focus is helping people become better guests, what if once a month, the episodes of your shows were people interviewing you so that you can showcase tactics as a guest not just as a host. And again, you could do the same thing or not, but you could do the analysis then of you as sort of a guest on that episode. Another thing you could do is what if you produced one less episode of your show each month and instead use that time, again, this is the limited time thing, so one less episode of your show and instead use that time to go on other people's podcasts. Shows about podcasting, shows about PR, shows about book promotion, shows about whatever. Take your expertise on the road and elsewhere, the chances are if you did that, that would probably be better for you. Again, you have limited time, but if you repurposed one of your podcast times each month to go on other podcasts, would probably get you more than just doing another episode of your podcast. And the key takeaway here with all these, hopefully you can see, is that once you figure out what you want and how you want to position yourself, you can use that as a filter and apply it to everything that you're doing so it's aligned with that. And that gets you over what you said, where it's very hard to kind of position your niche, right? Those slight tweaks reinforce what you want people to know about you and how you want them to think about you and ultimately how you want them to hire you, buy from you, work with you. Does that all make sense? Yeah, it makes all the sense in the world. And then you start imagining the landing page at damngoodconversations.com. Mm -hmm. The messaging shifts. Yeah. Right? It becomes a little more specific. You, you have that skill of like whipping up copy in like five minutes or at least the illusion of five minutes. So mm -hmm. that's probably a separate conversation. But I think that's super helpful for me. I know it is for me. And I think for other people, I don't think that would eliminate other speaking and coaching opportunities, but no. it would allow the streamlined nature to take over. So that's- Yeah, and I think, honestly, I think it's gonna actually get you more opportunities because it's gonna clarify what this guy's expertise is. So you're gonna have people who come to you, they're gonna go, okay, well, I'm not going on any podcasts, but this guy seems to really know how to help people have these conversations and accomplish their goals. I'm going on a bunch of job interviews. Maybe this guy could help me figure out what to say. I have a presentation. My job at my company is to lead brainstorming sessions. Once they see you as the expert in that, they'll make the leap and apply it to their own thing in ways that are not necessarily the obvious. So yeah, I think it'll actually help you get those opportunities as opposed to sort of shutting them out. Okay, let's get to your next question. What's the next thing that you want to know? Second yeah. question that I want to know, Josh, what aspect of podcasting, now that you've been in it for a while, did you drastically underestimate? It's funny because even though I hadn't launched my own podcast, I had been on a bunch of podcasts. I listened to a bunch of podcasts. I'm in this creator space. So I felt going into it. On the one hand, I was non-naive. So I wouldn't say there was a ton of stuff that I like massively underestimated. 
But there definitely were some things that even with that knowledge, I was like, whoa, this is even more so than than I thought. So I'm going to share those things. But before I do, I actually posted a tweet thread this morning. And it's not exactly about stuff I underestimated, but it is about I'm sharing the value that I get from the podcast, totally unrelated to downloads and monetization that I think I may be sort of new, but is much clearer to me. And I think a lot of people, certainly people that don't have podcasts, don't see. They think about it's like, well, it's only valuable if you get a bunch of downloads or make money and get sponsors. And I think this is value that people would get from it, even if they didn't. So I'm going to start by just sort of reading off some of these things. So the first one is because of the way that I've structured the show, where guests come on and ask me questions in most episodes, each episode has become a forcing function for me to come up with answers and communicate them. So you asking me a question or whoever comes on and asks me a question forces me to actually sit down and go, well, what do I think about that? What advice do I have with that? And then to communicate that. That is super valuable, even if nobody listens. Another one, again, based on this format, it really helps me understand what people struggle with. What are the questions that they're submitting? What do they want to know? That's helpful in a variety of ways. The show has given me a sandbox to learn firsthand how to grow a podcast and a YouTube channel. I did no video before this show. I had no podcast before this show. So I could help people, but now I actually am able to firsthand learn how will I grow a podcast? Like, what do I need to know about YouTube? So that's super helpful. It's a way to scale the help I give to people. You know this because we've had some conversations before one-on-one. If I didn't have this podcast, you and I would have this same conversation. Everything I just said to you, you would have heard and found helpful and no one else ever would have heard it. So just capturing these conversations and putting them out allows me to help a lot more people with basically the same amount of time and effort. When people see me on video or hear me on audio, it creates a deeper and different connection than just written words and tweets, blog posts, and newsletters. That's more qualitative than quantitative, but I can feel it. I can sense that when you see or hear someone, you get to know them a little better. It's a different connection. My show format allows anyone in my audience to be a guest and get exposure to my audience if they have good questions to ask. It's one of the things that I think is really cool about it, where there's people who are just starting, they're never going to get booked on a podcast, but they could get booked on mine if they have good questions. So that's another way for me to serve my audience. It's a powerful content creation engine. So the time I spend recording an episode generates content I can use over and over again, not just video clips, but I can repurpose things that I say. It gives me two new places where people can discover me in search or recommendations on YouTube and on all these podcast platforms. It creates an opportunity for me to invite experts on as guests and learn from them directly. About once a month, I do a flip the script episode where I ask the questions. So it's pretty cool. I had Roberto Blake on, who's a YouTube expert. I don't know much about YouTube. I'm starting out to be able to have him on and ask him three questions. And I learned a ton from it. That's certainly valuable. And then the last thing I would say is in terms of value that people may not realize, answering people's questions on my podcast each week gives me a chance to practice my consulting work. It's like going to the gym. Once a week, someone's coming on and the conversation we're having is not all that different than if someone hired me as a consultant. I have some thoughts and suggestions for them. We go back and forth. So I've created a, even if no one listened to this, I've created a way to sort of practice each week. Okay. And so that's sort of hidden value, which I know is not exactly your question, but I think people, I thought people would find interesting. As far as what I've underestimated... It's interesting, as much as I am a huge proponent of newsletters, I never had a podcast of my own to promote in it. I think I underestimated how important my newsletter would be to getting any traction. It is by far the biggest driver of downloads or views on YouTube. I think without it, it would have been very hard and very slow going growing my podcast, even with a large Twitter following, even with the ability to get booked on some other shows. And by no means is my podcast, like I'm not getting millions of downloads. Like I'm getting a few thousand downloads a month. But when I look at it, like I can see, I don't know where it would be without the newsletter. So I think I underestimated how important, not just having an audience, but having an email audience going into it in terms of getting it sort of up and running. I went into this knowing that a podcast is not as simple as it seems in terms of there's a million like, little decisions you need to make. What are you going to call the show? What's the artwork going to be? How are you going to write the descriptions? What platform are you going to use? How are you going to edit it? 
are you going to do video? How are you going to title the YouTube videos? What are you going to do for the thumbnails? Even going into it, knowing there were a million things and even going into it, knowing I was like, look, we'll just get it up and we'll iterate as we go and we'll figure out, like, I wasn't going to get bogged down with YouTube thumbnail strategy. Like I knew it wasn't going to be perfect. But even with all that said, there are so many components to it, especially doing video as well. But even if I wasn't doing video, I had never thought about how do I want to write the show descriptions? I had never thought about, do I want to do transcripts or not? I had never thought about where is it going to live on the website? Is it going to have its own website? Is it going to be on my website? All these little things. And what's interesting is a lot of them, I didn't really have a strong take on. Like there were some things where it's like, I know what I want this to be, I like format wise and that kind of stuff. But a lot of it, it was like, I didn't have a strong take on what the description should be but I had to figure out something, right? So there's so many little components that go beyond just what is the show going to be and we're going to record it and whatever. So that I definitely think I underestimated. And then I guess I would say, it's funny because I was thinking about this and I guess I would have to say maybe I underestimated how much I'd like doing it. I went into it very specifically saying I'm going to commit to 12 episodes. Like in my mind, I was like, I'm going to do a season, do one episode a month for three months, and then regroup, see how it's going, maybe stop, maybe take a break before season two. And as I was doing it, I was like, I don't want to take a break. Like, I feel like we're building momentum. Like, let, let's just keep going. So I guess in some ways I underestimated that. I'm curious for you, and you've been doing it a lot longer than me. So I, mean, I don't know if you can remember back to then, but what did you underestimate when you got started? I think when I got started, I wanted to do it for intrinsic reasons. Fun to talk to Josh Spector. Mm -hmm. learn, become a better person, a better teacher, a better husband, maybe a little bit more creative. And then I thought that downloads just magically come out of the sky because your show is quote unquote better than another show, which we'll get to in question three. Yeah. And then a mattress company would come and sponsor the show and then an underwear company and then fresh books and all the rest. And that's where the monetization would come in. And I think even if any money's coming from podcasts, I think it gets back to one of the things we've talked about before is you don't write a book to make money. You don't start a podcast to make money. But if things go right and you work hard and the right things happen, you can make money because of the book, because mm -hmm. of the podcast. And I that concept just did not make sense to me. And, and now it yeah. does. Yeah. And it's also, I guess, maybe I underestimated this. And maybe this is sort of what I'm getting at with the newsletter thing. And I was told this and sort of warned this beforehand. I don't know that I fully appreciated it. Like, it's hard to grow an audience for a podcast. I think it's much harder than other platforms. Even if it's good, even if you're starting with an existing audience, like, it's hard. It doesn't spread the way other things spread. And I know, I know in addition, right, that, that connects perfectly. This is a comical thing I underestimated that you could relate to mm -hmm. this. For people listening, thinking of starting a podcast, I underestimated that my friends from high school, from college, in the neighborhood will not give a damn about the podcast. They yeah. don't give a flying fig w that I have a podcast. Like, yeah. it doesn't matter that I had Mitch Album, who wrote Tuesdays with Maury, one of my favorite. They do not care. I can post an avocado salad on a different social media platform. Right. And they legitimately are more impressed than the that's fact so that funny. James Clear, who outsold Michelle Obama yeah. one month in Amazon, like insane. That's stuff. absolutely true. And by the way, that's true of like newsletters too. Like now I, now I don't even bother, but years ago, like I would say to like my wife, I'd be like, Hey, did you read my newsletter today? And you're this week or whatever. And she'd be like, nah, I'd be like, I'm like, are you curious to see, like, for, like, I know you're not in this space, but are you curious to see what I have to say? Nope. Not not Do not, not use your friends and family as your barometer, folks. Yeah, that's what that's what it is. Yeah, I got question that's number so three. Funny. What I want to know. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah, now, go for it. Here's a meta moment. When I coach podcast hosts in a vacuum, I would say, in general, ask shorter questions. Mm -hmm. But when I work with more advanced clients, which is something I really love, I'll say know the rule and break the rule. So with that mm -hmm. spirit in mind, here is an intentionally long, messy question that I know is tailored just for you. Let's talk status roles. I wanna know about status roles on podcasts. I'm gonna okay. make a number of statements. Many people believe, I believe a lot of these, and I would love your reaction to anything that jumps out of you. Authors and creators don't need podcasts to promote their work. They're, they're happening anyway, and yet these authors still go on podcasts. That's one piece. 
Okay. Authors and creators very rarely, certainly infrequently, share their appearances. I, I'm sure you've seen this. Daniel Pink, God love you. I love you, Daniel. You're not sharing my podcast after you go on for whatever reason. You're not sharing. <laughs> right. James right. shared it once and great, and I was thankful. Podcasters do a tremendous amount of work in preparation. We live with the work. When I had you on the podcast, I'm living with your work for days. I'm excited all day to have you on. And, and yet, it's, it's just that with all that in mind, it's very unclear to me the relationship between a quality podcast and a downloaded podcast, between a ranked high podcast mm -hmm. and a host who prepares. It seems to me that even after all these years of podcasting, the formula, the recipe for a successful podcast remains murky at best. I want to yeah. know what you make of all that. Okay. So let's take these, let's take these one by one. Let's start with your first one, I think, was the idea that like authors and creators don't need podcasts to promote their work, yet they appear on podcasts. So when let me let me just clarify what the statement is. So when you say they don't need podcasts, do you mean they don't need to go on podcasts? Do you mean they don't need to have their own podcasts? All of the they above. Don't, they don't need to go on. I want to whisper this because I don't want to lose authors. Yeah. No, they okay. need my podcast, but yet they go on it. So they, there must be some feeling that it's going to help mm -hmm. drive business. Okay. So I would say the first part of that, I would say like the word needs really important because I agree that they don't need them. Nobody needs any channel. I talk about this with social media all the time. Like you don't need to be everywhere. Like you don't need to be anywhere to be perfectly honest. Plenty of people can have successful businesses and careers without using social media at all. So I completely agree with the idea that they don't need it. That said, I do think it would be foolish of them not to leverage them. I do think they are incredible opportunities to get in front of, especially if you're going on a specific targeted audience, especially if you're good at it and understand how to talk about your stuff, which is why they should hire you to actually make the most of the opportunity. And so I do think that it makes sense for them to do it. I also think those podcast appearances become easy, with, not that they all take advantage of this, but more of them probably should. It becomes easy ways for them to create additional content that they can leverage. Even if they're not taking the podcast clip, going on a show, someone asking you about something, they're not the only one that had that question. You can say, oh, again, even if you're not using the actual audio or video clip, you can take the paragraph that you said to somebody and go, that's a social post. If you go be interviewed by somebody in a 45 minute show, you could probably easily get a month's worth of posts. If you said interesting stuff, if they ask good questions, whatever. The other thing is I think, and James Clear actually, and I'm going to come back to him in a second as well, but James Clear was on Tim Ferriss's show and he was talking about the orchestrating of podcast appearances. So it seems like there he's everywhere, like when there's a launch. And I do think there's an ancillary benefit to that that goes beyond just the individual show of this concept that like, wow, everywhere I look, James Clear is, and he's got this book coming out and whatever. So I do think that, I don't think they need it. I do think it is worth their time and effort when they're strategic about how they do it. The other thing I would say is part of this, when you're starting to talk about sort of bigger names and bigger stuff, I've worked in both journalism as a reporter and in PR years ago, and some of this is publicists need bookings to prove their worth. Do they need to go on all these podcasts they're going on? Probably not, but someone's paying a publicist thousands of dollars a month to go, I got you on this show and that show and this other show, or at least I got you offers for this show or that show or the other show. Does that, does that go towards answering the other question of then, let's make up an author so we're not offending anyone. Brian yeah. Smith, New York Times bestselling author, made that up. Mm -hmm. Why is Brian, after going on my show, never tweeting or posting on LinkedIn that he went on 1% better? So I would say a couple of things. I would say that, first of all, some of those people aren't active on social Anyway, that's a piece of it. If they're not active on social, it's unlikely they're going to share it. Another thing, some of those people are doing so many things that they might feel like, well, if I'm doing 100 podcasts, I'm not going to share every single podcast. It's just too much. Who cares? A big part of it, I think, in a lot of cases is the podcaster themselves has not made it easy enough for them to share. Did they give them materials? Did they say, hey, here's the tweet, just hit retweet. Like make it as easy as possible for them 
to share and you will increase the chances that they do so. I think a lot of times people have a guest on and they never even send them a link to the episode, let alone here's an image you can post on Instagram. I posted the tweet. Literally, all you have to do is click retweet. The easier you can make it for people, even if it's like, hey, I wrote the post for you. All you have to do is copy and paste it into your into your thing. So I think making it easy will will make them more likely to do so. But I think in general, especially now, I actually think that the the booking of big I'm using the word stars, but anyone with a sort of big audience and whatever, I actually think it's really overrated for the podcast or podcaster themselves. And not just because they won't necessarily share it. I think it's overrated because most of these big people have done a million podcasts already. And the people that are interested in them feel like they've already heard what they have to say. So, and this is not a James Clear knock. I like James Clear is great. But if James Clear, to use your made up person, if Brian Smith puts out a book and Brian Smith does 20 different podcasts talking about what the book's about, and I've listened to one of them, I don't really care about the others. I've heard what he has to say. So even if he promoted it, his fans are probably like, I already listened to you on that other show. I don't need to listen to you talk about the same thing. And I think that's what tends to happen, right? People book these quote unquote big stars and they're all talking to them about the same thing. So I think if you were able to book a star, one of the keys or one of the things that I would try to do would be to try to focus the conversation on something they haven't talked about before, but your audience and a large audience would want to know. So let me use James Clear here as an example. Let's say you were able to book James Clear. Does anyone really need to hear him talk about habits again? And I don't mean that as a knock. It's awesome. But the people that know James Clear and are interested in James Clear have read the book, have already heard him talk about habits on 30 different podcasts. But most podcasts would default to James Clear, habit. And even if you're asking different questions, if the overall topic is James Clear on habits, James Clear fans already know and have already heard a million times what he has to say about habits. Even if he has new stuff to say, that's not going to come across in the James Clear on Habits episode. So what I think would be way more interesting is if you book James Clear to get him to talk about something that he hasn't talked about, maybe. So maybe the episode isn't James Clear on Habits. Maybe it's James Clear on how he works with an assistant or how he runs a company with one employee. Right now, those James Clear fans are like, oh, I'm actually interested in hearing that. Like, I admire his work. I, I admire his stuff. And what that does is it leverages, in this case, James's or a, any big star's popularity while hearing about something or from someone you haven't heard before. I actually think if I had the option, this is going to sound insane. And it might be insane, but I'm going to say it anyway. If I had the option between booking James Clear or booking James Clear's assistant or one employee, I think I'd take the assistant or the employee. Wow. Because if you're asking me what has the potential, I don't think anyone's heard that. And I think an episode with James Clear's one employee would get more traction and more attention than the 8 millionth podcast with James Clear. So conceptually, I think it's interesting to think about, and by the way, James Clear might be more likely to share it, which is a whole other, going back to your point of why aren't these people sharing their episodes. You're a crazy genius, Josh. Right? But so I think considering how can I leverage this big person's reach and notoriety, but find a different angle into it, or even talk to a different person in their universe. Is there, is it more interesting to interview Seth Godin or to interview a consulting client of Seth Godin's. I don't think he does that much consulting, but a nonprofit that Seth Godin has come in and helped and interview them. What was it like working with Seth? What did he tell you to do? What surprised you about the approach? Like, can you find that different stuff? I think is a more interesting way to approach just sort of the general big star that's talking about the same stuff everywhere. I have no words for that. That's amazing. And we, we, now we have something to talk about when, when the camera stops rolling. Yeah. I have a, I have some... By the way, that that is a perfect example of going back to what I was talking about, the hidden value of this podcast. All that stuff that I just suggested, I have never thought of before. But your question prompted me to think about it. And that's the value of this podcast. So, okay. So the next one you had, I think, was something about preparation that podcasters do. Yeah, just just in 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 kind of closing, it's the idea that it's an unclear relationship because on, I've heard people say, high profile guest, 
podcasters think we should share their show. I've heard high profile guests say it's ridiculous that we wouldn't share the show because the author thinks in some cases they're doing us a favor. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, the podcaster says, yeah, but we're giving you a platform. It's, right. a, it's a bizarre relationship, right. the theme of this, this, this question. Well, and I think it's also it's different in every it's different in every case, right? Because there's so many variables here. Show size, the the alignment between the show audience and the book. To, using book as an example, the book that the person has to promote. Again, the author's willingness and how interactive they are with their own audience and how much they share to begin with. But the other place I wanted to go with this was you talked about this idea that podcasters do a tremendous amount of preparation to ready themselves for upcoming guests. I think your bias as you being someone who does a tremendous amount of preparation has skewed that assumption. I actually don't think that's true. I think in most cases, I think you're more the exception than the rule, right? And I think it's part of what makes your show really good. But I think in most cases, most podcasters don't do much prep at all. And for that matter, I think most guests don't do any prep at all. And I think it shows. So one of the things that I think has made my show good in my own completely biased opinion is that the questions are decided in advance. Both parties know what three things we're going to talk about. And at times, like even with us, you had suggested some questions and it was like, hey, maybe we go in this direction with this question because it'll be more valuable to my audience. So that allows both sides to be more prepared. There are still improvised elements and it is still an improvised conversation, but that bit of prep helps improve the show. There's a reason why most TV shows do pre-interviews. Even if it's just for entertainment purposes, what's gonna be the most entertaining story we can share and whatever. And yes, Again, the good stuff comes from improvisation. It's not that it's all like, let's just go through what we rehearse. But I think that preparation can really help. And the goal for me as a podcaster and also as a guest, by the way, is how do we create the most valuable thing possible? I believe that the show is going to provide more value if I know what you want to ask me ahead of time because I can think through what I want to say. It could still be good if I'm just sort of winging it off the top of my head. But I think most shows... There's not a lot of preparation, right? Like I, I, when I'm interviewed all the time on other people's podcasts, a lot of times I don't have any idea where they want to go until like we get on the show, which is fine. But a lot of times I notice they don't even really know where they want to go. Like they're asking the same, like, so tell us about yourself and all that kind of stuff. And that's fine, but I don't think that's the way you create the best possible show. And then the last thing you talked about this unclear relationship between quality of podcasts, ratings, rankings, popularity. I totally agree with that, but I think it's in part because quality is a completely subjective word. Quality can mean a lot of different things. So for example, is Mark Marin's podcast a higher quality podcast than mine? It is. If you want to hear interviews with celebrities and you want to learn about comedy and comedians, if you define quality as production value, if you define quality, maybe his interview skills, if, you know, if he's a better quote unquote host than me, but it's not higher quality podcast than mine if you want to know how to grow your audience in business. So the term quality, and I think a lot of people get stuck in this trap of like my show is not me, but I'm saying there's a lot of people that go like my show is so much better than that other show. Well, better for who better or I have higher production values and that show that sounds terrible, but that show is so popular. Like I don't understand quality is subjective and depends on a lot of different factors. Another piece of this, especially when you get into rankings and popularity and downloads and all that stuff is the niche factor. If you produce a podcast that's super valuable, super high quality, but it appeals and is aimed at a small niche of people, you're never going to top the charts. It's just not going to happen. Most of those shows that top the charts are pretty broad. That doesn't mean that you should do a broad show. It just means that you shouldn't look at it and go, I don't understand why I'm not higher on the charts. Well, you're doing a show that's going to appeal to 20 people. But maybe that's all you need because that aligns with like what you're trying to do. The charts are measuring something different than the success or quality of your show. Also, if you look at the top of the charts, usually they're aimed at broad audience. And nowadays they have significant marketing behind them. Even that might mean paid. That might just mean that there's a network behind them. That might mean that the host is on a TV show. Like there's a lot of factors that are leading into that that have nothing to do with the show itself. Personally, 
I don't really see ratings, rankings, and popularity overall as a goal. My goal is really how well am I serving my specific audience and how aligned is that with the rest of my business and am I attracting the right people? Are they finding it valuable? Is it creating those other sorts of opportunities for me? My podcast at this point, I think gets a couple thousand dollars per episode, which is definitely not huge, but I would, for me, I consider it a massive success. And I believe that the audience it's intended for would say it's really valuable. That's what I most care about. I get great feedback on it from the people that fit. That said, and this is a great place for me to, to wrap here, that doesn't mean I don't appreciate ratings and reviews. So if anyone's listening to this, go ahead and give me a rating and review. I would love to rise up the charts, but I'm not beating myself up if I if I don't rise up the charts. So good, man. I Thank you so much for taking the time, for investing the time, for doing it with such an enthusiastic mindset and, and generosity, right? Top five answers on the board when I think of Josh Spector, generosity, value, expertise, experience, humility, all of that, man. So thank you. Wow. Thank you. See, look at that. Put that in a, I'm going to put that somewhere. I'm going to use that clip somewhere. Joe, thank you so much for coming on. The questions were awesome. I hope people got a lot of value out of this. And I know they will love your show, not just the intro, which I demand that everybody listen to, but the show itself. So tell them where they can check out the show, where they can connect with you. I'm sure a lot of my audience does go on podcasts, does have podcasts. They would really benefit, I think, from your expertise. So Tell them where to go and get more. I love that. Thanks. The show is called 1% Better, launched in July 1st, 2017. Just celebrated a milestone, 250 episodes. So wow. it's been a labor of love and I've, and I've loved it. I'd love for anyone listening to take a listen to it, a conversation with an interesting person like you one week and then solo episodes the, the adjoining weeks. I'm about to launch a, a public speaking boot camp for people who want to be nice. better at podcasts, better public speakers. We're going to cap that at 12 people. So that'd be something cool if someone was just looking for that right now. And I'd love to connect with people at damngoodconversations.com where you could find out a little bit more coming soon there. Thanks so much for that plug. Awesome. For me, again, my newsletter is the best place to start for theinterested.com slash subscribe. Check out my skill sessions at joshspector.com slash sessions. I'm on Twitter all the time at Jay Spector. And if, like I mentioned before, anyone can be a guest on this show as long as you come up with three good questions. So go to joshspector.com slash questions. You can submit your questions and hopefully you will be on here one of these days and I'll be giving you some advice. Thanks for listening. As always, I appreciate your interest and I will see you next week.